Well, good morning. It is a privilege to be here. I thank Pastor Rice for inviting me, and of course, I thank every one of you who have supported Gateway since it was Archway back in 1985. That was a long time ago. And I thank our brother, Pepe Arnadegui, for delivering so many babies over the so many years. I've known him for many, many years. And of course, <clears throat> I've known Betty for 32 and a half years of volunteer service so far. So far, we haven't finished our, our commitment here. Please open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. I'll be reading verses 13 through 15. Romans 10, 13 to 15, our subject this morning, reconciling dead people. Follow along, if you would, in your word, copy of the word as I read, Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for the faith that's lived out by many of the people here as they have served at Gateway, as they have served in this church and other ministries in this uh, town and in this country. Father, we thank you for your love. We give all praise back to you. May you be glorified. May your word be opened. May our hearts be opened. And may you lead us into ministry. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. One of the fourfold aims of the Christian Missionary Alliance, right from the website, quoting directly, is to proclaim. It's to show and tell. The Bible, your website says, is the inspired text. It doesn't, never contradicts. We're commissioned to proclaim in word and in deed. We're not ashamed of the gospel, the CMA website says. We are Christ's ambassadors. It's a mission goal of your denomination. And my question is, is that your mission goal in life? Everyone has a goal in life. Everyone has plans for their life. Is this number one in your Christian life to see others come to Christ as well as glorify God? We become more thankful, and as we become more thankful in missions, we fully understand that we are the sent ones. We are the ones that God has blessed and privileged to bring the good news. Isn't it amazing? He takes a person like me, once an enemy of God, once dead in Christ, and then he renews us. We're born again. He makes us alive, and then he uses us to tell other people about him. That is amazing to me. So what's the purpose of a local church like Cranford Alliance? Well, the church, according to R.C. Sproul, is eternal. Its mission begins with the Father sending the Son into the world to accomplish redemption for us. You and I then become born again, and it is by his grace that we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, it is God's gift. So God has given us the gift of salvation, and our privilege is to bring the kingdom of God not only on earth, but to bring it and to prepare it throughout all ages. The mission of the church was a mandate given by God to Jesus, and it's been passed along to us. Jesus said this. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And this is our 34th year of ministry, trying to connect people to God, pleading with them to come to Christ through the cross of Christ. And we are there as long as people need us. People often ask me, how long are you going to be there with these women? As long as God directs and as long as they wish us to be. Bringing hope to the law, sharing the truth, being there when they're needed. People have real problems, as you realize. Lost lives do matter to God, and we need to be patient with him. God is patient. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
And we need to have within our DNA that patience with people. As sent ones, I believe our desire in this world is to see people reconciled to God. People are dead spiritually without God. Dead people cannot be made alive. Only God can make dead people alive. All people, no matter who they are, how nice they appear on the outside, all will appear before Christ. In, they'll have to answer for their sins. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Only those who've trusted Christ will be spared judgment. This is something many churches don't preach. Our text this morning is from Romans 10, and I like to use the term dead men walking. You say, well, didn't you say this four years ago? Yes, four years ago about this exact time I spoke to you on, do you see dead people everywhere? And our focus this morning is, do you see those dead people, and do you know how to see them reconciled to God? Your pastor has asked you, and I've looked at the tapes, he's asked you to be self-sacrificial in this next year. And I want to present to you an opportunity to continue and maybe begin afresh a relationship with Gateway to help men and women who basically made bad choices. But you and I have made bad choices, so it's okay for us to say that others do as well. Men and women who are loved by God like you are. Men and women whom Jesus died for, like you. Men and women who were or are dead without Christ, just like you are. So again, I ask the question, do you see spiritual dead people all around you? And if you do, will you take this further step, perhaps in your family, perhaps with your co-workers, perhaps friends in school, or perhaps at the pregnancy center, or people you rub shoulders with, will you take that further step of bringing them the gospel? How exactly can dead people be reconciled to God? In Romans, we find the answer. So look into Romans, if you would, if you have a copy of the scripture, Romans 10, 1. We see God's desire for people through the apostle Paul. Paul desires that people come to know Christ. He wants the salvation of the people Israel. I bear them witness, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And the problem, according to one uh, paraphraser, one commentator, John Gill, was they understood the law, and they knew there was something called the gospel, and they thought that they were contrary to each other. So what they did was they opposed the gospel in order to uphold the law. And by doing that, they became enemies of God. For being ignorant, verse 3, of the righteousness of God, they sought to establish their own righteousness. And people who are not religious somehow do establish their own set of, of morals or code. And this is what occurred then, a system of rules. Now, you don't have to be religious to have a system of rules. Men and women need freedom from rules. They need a relationship with the God who made them. And God, I believe, is called Gateway and other missions in New Jersey for such a time as this. Verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes. Verse 6, the righteousness based on faith, drop down to verse 8, is the word that's near you in your mouth and in your heart. And it's the word of faith that we proclaim. We proclaim God's righteousness. It is not difficult to understand and, and embrace it, but we have to give up something. We have to give up our pride. We have to open our hearts. The Word of God is so easy, a child can understand it, but it takes a childlike heart to be changed. In order to, as we sang, love from the inside out, you and I need a new heart. That's the problem. And that's why at Gateway, we don't just talk about babies, we don't talk about relationships or the woman or anything else. We talk about the heart because the heart is what's estranged from God, no matter what the relationship may be. The heart is the center of the pro-life movement. And it is sad that unlike 90% of pregnancy centers in the United States, Gateway is one of the few, if not the only one, in New Jersey that actually shares Christ with each and every person. Betty's been doing that, others have been doing that for 30 years. But other centers 
are there and they do good work, but seeing the person come to Christ is not the number one mission. Our mission as Christians, according to Matthew 28, is to see people come to Christ and to grow in their relationship. Then verse 9, the core of what it's all about. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. Not might be saved, not should be saved, but you will be saved. That is salvation. That's the essence of the good news. That is good news to everyone, whether they're here or whether they're out there. And we are commanded to share that. Matthew 10, 32. If you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before God. And if you d deny me before my Father, then you will be denied as well. So men and women need to respond. God has given a clear message that can be understood. He's put you as an ambassador into this world, now that you know Christ, to share that message. For with the heart... Man believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Verse 11, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. God is always true. Let me ask this simple question. Have you ever been disappointed in people? Trust in people, and you're bound to get disappointed. Isn't it true? Trust in God's word. You will never, ever be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same is Lord, verse 12, bestowing his riches upon all who call. All need Christ. Rich, poor, young, old, married, single, in a church, unchurched, in a pregnancy center. They need Christ. We are simply taking the message and using the vehicle of the pregnancy center. That's all it is. We're in a vehicle. That vehicle could be another vehicle. The vehicle is not the message. The message is Christ. The vehicle is the pregnancy center. God has been gracious to us, his former enemies. And I believe, and this is our premise this morning, I believe that God has called us to be ministers of reconciliation. We see that in verse 13. And then secondly, God has called us through the message of reconciliation, verse 14, and lastly, you as a believer are the messenger of reconciliation. So look at the text, verse 10, uh, verse 13. And note that you and I can't fix people, and we can't solve their problems. After 32 years, I've realized that the same thing happens again and again. Women become pregnant. A boyfriend decides he'll either leave them or stay with them or he'll force an abortion, or he won't. They'll decide to abort or not to abort. They'll have the baby. It, nothing changes except that people still need the Lord and that God is gracious to them and has not given up on them. So that message that your pastor shared this morning really is the heart of what I'm saying here. God has not given up on this world. He hasn't given up on people. He hasn't given up on you. He is not like us. We give up on people. We have limits. God has no limits. The testimony in Romans 10, 13 comes out of Joel 2, 32. Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved before that great and terrible day of the Lord. So read Joel 2 and you see some of what we see here this morning in Romans. There's an external call for people to be saved. That can be resisted. We have people telling us, I don't want to hear. That can be despised. We can be attacked verbally, even physically. But God calls us, demands for us to be faithfully challenged. I was speaking to a man in the narthex as to how I came to Christ. And when I came to Christ, there was no turning back. So there's nothing that can be done to me where I can stop sharing what God did, because I'm going to get from here to heaven because a lady named Anne, who's now 85, once was 37, shared with me God's love, and she said, you need Christ. And God opened my heart, and the message that you and I received when we first came to Christ, if you've come to Christ, is the message that God wants you to share. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Now, when you call upon, it's not 
accusing him of a crime. It means to cry out. That's what the word means. Cry out to a living, loving, caring, compassionate, completely forgiving, and utterly forgetting God, an all-powerful God, unlike you and I. Sometimes we forgive, we don't forget. God forgives and forgets. He is Lord, curious. He is not just a God. He's not a feeling or an emotion or a force. He is a person, and he wants to give you a new heart, a new heart that you can cry out to him, a new heart so you could be changed from the inside out as we sang. But we have to reach that heart. We don't reach that heart just by reaching the person's problem. That's a beginning. And I praise God that we can work in the pro-life arena and do sonograms and all that's done, baby items and, and pregnancy tests and homeless shelters. We do all of that, but we can't have that as our end. Our mission has to be the heart of the person. All this is from God who reconciled this to himself, and he called us, you and me, you and me, to a ministry of reconciliation because he is the one that reconciles dead people. In Ephesians we read, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off, you were unpeaceful, unloving, unkind, you were far off. There was a wall, a wall of separation, God broke down that wall through Jesus. We were aliens. We were strangers. You are no longer an alien or a stranger. You are a fellow citizen and a saint and a member of the household of God. Sometimes we miss all these words because we're so used to them, but that's how God thinks of you. That's how he thinks of you. Peace and access. That is the nature of evangelism. We can have peace with God and access to God. That's what good news is. Now, good news also means there's bad news. And the bad news is there's a day coming when we will have to appear before Christ. We will appear before God and answer. And there are those who, who do not know Christ will have nothing except their good works. And that will be insufficient. In more than three decades that I've known Betty, we have seen at Gateway 37,000 people. We've seen 5,500 babies born, hundreds of men uh, coming to the center. But what's great is 4,000 people have come to Christ. And I give glory to that because perhaps we can do a pregnancy test or a sonogram or refer people to my brother Pepe. But I can't save a heart. That I can't do. I can't change hearts. I can give them the gospel, and so can you. But we can't change hearts, and this is what God has done. Is it worth it all? Yes, because it's good news. It is the power of God for salvation. John Piper has put it this way, believing and preaching the gospel sometimes put Paul in a really bad light, and it may put us in a bad light. But Paul had a, something that I don't see today, and I'd like to see more of. He didn't have an utter disdain of those people around him. He thought of himself as what? A debtor. He was in debt to those who were persecuting him. He didn't have a disdain. And it is so easy in America right now to have disdain rather than to see the debt that we have to God and the responsibility and privilege we have to the lost, to the unbelieving. He was overwhelmed with undeserved grace. And the question is, are you overwhelmed with undeserved grace? If you are, if you are, then you will see God as a loving God who loves sinners, even though they sin. And believe me, I see people mess up in ways you wouldn't even think of. And they continue to do it. But we have a loving God. Our role in missions is that of an ambassador to communicate the message, not to interpret the message. We are communicators, not commentators. We have a lot of commentators today, social media commentators and church commentators. God wants us to be more communicators. I've been reading Deuteronomy, and in Deuteronomy 12 and 16, we're talking about the evil of the uh, Asherim cult fertility goddess and, and uh, all of that, ensnared by the surrounding culture, believers who have become reactionary 
condemning rather than revolutionary. And today we don't have the people of the word that your pastor has spoken of. We have people who are often reactionary and people who are ensnared. We have Christians dating non-Christians. We have marriages that are unequally yoked. We have Christians taking their kids to abortion places. Churches that have leadership or people within the church that have so many problems with pregnancy. 18% of all abortions are born-again Christians. So the problem is not out there. The problem often, the blood, is within a, the bricks of the church. And our job is to begin here. To begin here, not look at it as a problem out there. Moloch worship basically was taking the child and putting him into the fire. And that's exactly what we do with abortion. And we continue to do it. And politics and all of that will not change. The heart of the nation needs to change one by one. Our heart needs to change. We have to admit that this is our problem. We have, according to Deuteronomy, perverted justice, and we've celebrated idolatry. Not you, perhaps, but this nation has. And the gospel work begins here, cleaning up our own building, and then going out there as well. Your founder, A.B. Simpson, said something really radical. He said, the chief danger of the church today, that was in the 1900s, early, he said, is trying to get on the same side of the world instead of turning the world upside down. You follow that? In other words, the chief problem 120 years ago when he said this was that people were slipping so close to the world that you couldn't tell the difference instead of what Paul did, turn the world upside down. So be careful that we are not like, oh, well, my candidate is pro-life and that guy is not pro-life, or this cable news station really has all the answers, or, you know, it's those sinners... Because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, they is us. I've met the enemy, and they is us. Satan loves it when Christians take sides and debates in the world. And we are being tempted by Satan to take a debate. Which network do you use? You, do you look to? And which presidential candidate? Or which party are you? Who are you? How do you identify yourself? And sometimes we slip into that. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He's good to all. He's merciful. This is the God we follow. Reconciliation is at the core of the gospel. We are the ones that need peace with God. We are the ones that were separated from God. And we need to bring that message. Book of Romans has everything to do with love and mercy and reconciliation. Look at these verses. Romans 5 too. We exult in hope. We stand as debtors. We need to be reconciled. While we were still weak, Christ died for us. He showed his love for us while we were yet sinners. While we were his enemies, we were reconciled. Romans 5.10. 2 Corinthians. Christ reconciled us to himself, and then he sent us out to reconcile others. Now, Ephesians, you who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Colossians, you were alienated, you were hostile in mind. He's reconciled through his flesh to present you holy and blameless and without reproach. That's who you are in Christ. In the mirror, you're something else. Maybe you don't like what's in the mirror. But in Christ, you are a new person. Some of us need to look at who we are in Christ and stop looking in the mirror and stop reading what's on social media about us or posting about things about other people. We need to see people as in Christ. I want to share with you uh, a testimony of someone who called upon the name of the Lord about 10, 15 years ago and came to Christ. And this is Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Araniel, and this is my daughter Layla. Hi. And in 2008, my mom found Gateway um, when I was pregnant with Layla. Um, at that time, I had a lot of insecurities and fears, and I had struggled with depression for the majority of my teenage years. Um, Gateway had eventually led me to another organization um, who led me to Christ when Layla was just a couple months old. Um, I then decided to go back to Gateway as a volunteer counselor where I discovered my love for counseling. Um, I felt fulfilled. I felt like I was utilizing the gifts that God had planted in my heart. Um, 
And so I decided to go back to school to pursue my education. Um, just last May, I graduated with my master's degree in social work. And um, last week, I got engaged to um, this amazing um, man who I met through my church. Um, he loves me, he loves Layla, and uh, most importantly, he keeps Christ at the center of everything. And so when I think about um, my life, when I think about the time that I started Gateway up until this point, um, God put a verse on my heart. Um, you read it? And the verse is, I have come, I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. John 10.10. 10. And so when we think about that verse, um, I just think about um, how that's true for all of us, how it's true for me, um, it's true for you, and it's true for all the men and women who come through the doors at Gateway, um, that we all just have to know that God has a plan, that his plan is perfect, and that his intention is that all of us would have life more abundantly, that we would um, thrive. And I will stop here and point to that man. God blessed her a year ago with a guy who could be the father of that little girl. They're going to be married May 5th. I just got the invitation for the shower. That's the fruit of God's reconciliation. This is what God does in the lives of people if we allow it. The gospel, secondly, is about reconciliation. It is a message. How will they hear? These are questions. Paul's asking question after question. How will they call upon him if they haven't believed? How will they believe in him whom they've never heard? Verse 14. How are they to hear without someone preaching? And that doesn't mean this man. This means a herald or a proclaimer. So you don't need a preacher. Oh, let him do it. No, you need a heralder or proclaimer. So if Jesus changed your life, you're the guy. You're the gal. You don't have to go to Bible school to share your faith. The process of seeing and hearing. Now, we do do tests, as I mentioned, and all of those things, but none of this can replace speaking to the heart of people. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, Proverbs said, and what? He who is wise wins souls. We want to be wise in this world. We need to go to the heart of the problem. Pastor Rice challenged you this year to be people who make disciples. Matthew 28. I was listening. He challenged you, and this is from the website, to be involved in a gospel show and tell. I'm here to highlight the go tell part. Okay? Yes, show. But I'm saying go tell. Go tell. Reconciling the world to himself, Jesus did not hold it against people, and neither should we. But we need to bring them the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. What is that gospel? Very simply, I deliver to you of first importance. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the scripture. Yes, your testimony is important, but your testimony is not the gospel. Your testimony may be used to bring the gospel, but it's not the gospel. The gospel, as we well know in a church like this, is not moral liberalism. Of course not. It's not winning a debate with spiritually dead people. How totally unfair. They're dead. They don't know Christ, and you're heaping disdain upon them. Yes, they're sinners, but you were once yourself. It's not a catchy phrase. The gospel isn't, well, God has a purpose for your life. Yes, he does. I'm here to tell you one of the purposes, one of the main purposes, is to get out there with the gospel. It's not for you to be a rich person, or to be financially free, or health, or wealth, or prosperity, or any of that. It's not just a sequence of steps, A, B, C, D. I'm in B or C, and I'm doing fine. It's not condemnation and ridicule against somebody who's not doing any of this. Well, I'm better because they're not doing it at all. I have people in my family that don't even go to church. It's not commentary on social media. Many Christians have just risen up to be commentators, not communicators. It's not behavior modification. Your pastor said that. He said that in his message. It's not health and wealth, stepping into your destiny. All of those are really catchy phrases. But they have nothing to do with what God has for your heart and for this world. It's not self-denial without repentance. People need to repent. They're not going to change their behavior until their heart changes. 
So we're not there to change behavior. And it's not doing more good than bad, so in the end, God will look favorably upon us. Before going any further, there could be in this auditorium a person who's never come to Christ. You've been here a long time. You know all of the church language. You believe what this man has said, but you never opened your heart to Christ. I believed everything that was said about God that I had heard, but I never had made that commitment until 1972. And perhaps you need to make it this morning. Today is Life Sunday. What a better thing to have is eternal life as we celebrate physical life. And then finally, the believer, you and I, have to walk in the sandals of readiness. That means we need to be the messengers. How are they to preach unless they're sent? How beautiful are the feet who preach good news? Well, these are not floor shimes. They're size nine and a half. No, we're not talking about feet and shoes, right? We're talking about a message of the herald, the feet that go to speak to people. How far do I have to go? Do I have to go to Africa? No. Can you come to Irvington? Well, I can't be like Betty. I, I can't give you 32 and a half years. Okay, I get it. Can you give us uh, three hours a week for six months? That's our commitment. Can you take the training that's coming up in February? Can you go perhaps to our Elizabeth office? Do you speak another language? Perhaps you could be used by God. Before you can go out there, you need to know that you can make it here. God is calling some of us to be here with that message. And how are they to preach? How are they to have an answer to their eternal accountability unless someone sends somebody and unless that somebody says something? A gal named Cindy lives in a very nice house west of here. Her parents, her mother knows Christ. She's 28 years old. She was formerly a drug abuser for many years. She's off of drugs, pregnant, has a boyfriend that I've never seen such a force on this person, just abusing her verbally. She needs friends. She needs help. She needs encouragement. God is calling us to befriend that type of person. She's a confused psychological person whose life right now is a mess, but who knows the way and who's looking for someone to walk in those sandals. Will you be that person? How beautiful are those feet of those who preach good news. Here is the privilege of reconciliation. The sent ones, you and I, are ambassadors. And an ambassador, as I mentioned, doesn't change the message. He just says, this is what I'm bringing the message. He doesn't comment on the message. He brings the message. So you may not be called upon in any way to comment on the message, but just bring that simple message. And you say, what is the message? I don't even know if I have one, but there, usually I'll carry a four spiritual laws. That's the message. God loves you. He cares for you. You need to repent. Christ died for your sins. Come to Christ. Very simple. When I came to Christ, I thought it was so simple. I was going to Hofstra University. I thought it was a cartoon track. But then I realized I was over here and Anne was telling me, you need to be over here. And the cross was in the middle and I was separated. God spoke to my heart. He changed me what? Inside out. And now I could love him from the inside out. I try to love him from the outside in. It didn't work. A lot of our people that come to Gateway want to love God. They've been in churches. They've been baptized. They've gone through everything that maybe some of you have. But they've never had an encounter with Christ because no one has ever taken the time to tell them about Christ. And this appeal is imploring, according to 2 Corinthians, we implore you on Christ's behalf, hear the gospel, respond to the gospel. That is the heart of missions. Missions isn't to change people's lifestyle. It's to allow God to change their hearts. Sinners are not estranged from you. So sometimes they're very friendly with us. They're estranged from God. The problem isn't you. It's all about us sometimes, isn't it? But it isn't. It's about their relationship to God. Some have never heard. Some will reject, but they're answerable to God. I'm answerable to God to get them that message. 
We need to hear the gospel. We are commanded to share it. God's sovereignty doesn't change or remove my responsibility. Oh, God will take care of it. That's not the sovereignty we're seeing in the scripture. People need to see biblical Christianity, not political Christianity, not cultural or sentimental or ecumenical. It's biblical Christianity. Satan has tricked us in so many ways, having us go in so many directions where the simple message can't be preached. Lorena and I know this couple. They could not be here, they're at my church. Uh, and Rekha is a little shy of sharing her testimony. But if you know anything about Facebook, you know that I have about 3,000 pictures of this little angel called Georgia, who's now grown up. And they came from Sri Lanka three years ago. They came not knowing Christ. They came from a Hindu background. And they walked into our office, and as Betty will attest, they said, Sir, we are here. And what they were saying is we are presenting ourselves not for a handout, but for your wisdom. In some countries, they want wisdom, not money. And these people wanted wisdom. They wanted guidance. They needed help. They came legally to the United States, and because she was pregnant, they were told, here's $50, go to Newark. Your people, the, the Tamil people are there. Go for it. They ended up in Newark with a cell phone, and they looked up and saw a big sign in Irvington, pregnant, need help. And that's it. They walked in, said, we're here. What do you do there? You love them. You help them. They were hungry. I asked them, do you have uh, plates? Yes, sir. We have two. Do you have a fork? Yes, sir. One. They had nothing. They slept on the floor. Now, three years later, he works at Kane, cutting the lawn. He has a good job. He's had good jobs all along. The little girl is all grown. And here's what our friend Rekha said. She said, Rosemary prayed for me. That was a big deal. And Betty and Rosemary and Mary Lou loved them when they came in. That means a lot to a woman. So here we have a princess who... Uh, is now three years old and is in school and is having fun in life and and I'm having all fun as as grandpas would on September um, in September 2016 uh, She was born and in April they both came to Christ and now they're over at the church serving where I'm one of the elders over there and This is God doing a change in somebody's life how exciting is that to see people reconciled? This is a perfect example. I had nothing to do with it. I couldn't script this. This was just God blessing me as an older person, saying, I love you. That's what it was. There was no work involved. It's all about blessing. Sometimes it's about work. Here's another illustration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Even if rejected, even if for a moment it's rejected. This is Jennifer. She already knew Christ when she came to Gateway. A believer in another church, in a youth group. She cried for two hours in our apartment, thinking she had to abort. My wife and I just heard her cry for two straight hours. That's a long time of crying. And she finally said, I can't abort. That's, that's wrong. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not aborting. So she saddled up and became a single mother for eight years, had the baby, loved the baby, people supported her, they loved her, God blessed her with Connor McGinnis, and now she's going to get married, and that little girl's going to have a daddy in her life. The fruit of reconciliation. God takes broken pieces and makes them into something beautiful. He takes lives that are shattered. One person who doesn't know Christ from Sri Lanka, another person who doesn't know Christ uh, and comes to know him. And then finally, Jen, who did know Christ. And one day, one time, one drink, one episode, one evening, changed the face of her whole life. And then she had the baby. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, as we close, I say that just to warn the pastor that I'm closing. People don't mean it. But, or do you not know 
that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, this is a great passage. Wait a second here. Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral. Here we go. Idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexualities. Go, Dean. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers. Yea, Paul will inherit the kingdom of God. You tell him, Paul. Come on. That's what we've been waiting for in this sermon. I'm against those things. I remind people of those things. I put it on Facebook. They're unsaved. I'm nothing like them. Good for you, Dean. Whoa. Wait a second. Uh, such were some of us. Oh, wow. Ouch. Sorry about that. I should have read that first. You mean I was like that? Oh, I better zip it as they tell Georgia in school because God has reconciled me. He loved me enough even though I was all of those things Maybe not all of those things, but I was other things. But he saved me, he forgave me. How can I look at a homosexual and condemn the person? Do you think I have a view on what the Bible says? Do you think I know the view? Ask your pastor, ask others. I have the view that Scripture has about homosexuality. And that's why, with urgency, I would love and share with the homosexual. But to say to a person, I hate you because of your sin, is like looking in the mirror and saying that God continues to hate you, although he's willing to forgive you. I love the person who's an abortionist so much that I would go to him, and I've done that. Why? Because they're lost. They have no friends at all. They don't even have their own friends to love them. Have you ever really ministered to people who are homosexuals? They're lost people, and often they're looking, why do you even talk to me? Because of your religion. We've been so forced into accepting and so forced into tolerating that we've forgotten love. I met my wife and dated her 40 years ago, and I didn't say, I tolerate you. She would have never married me for that. I said, I love you. I don't tolerate homosexuals. I don't tolerate people who get abortions. I don't tolerate abortionists. I love them because God loves them. Can't you separate, can't I separate the sin from the sinner? God does. He took vile people. The God who looked on billions of people and said, Whoa, how bad are you? And said, I'm going to overlook it because I love you enough to send my, only, my one and only son to die for you. That's all God is asking for you to do today is to go to those people that's an open door. Those people who are hated by this world, who are looked upon by this world with disdain. People expect Christians to have a loving attitude towards people who are sinners, and yet we are often the people who seem to hate the people that God died for through Christ. Go out there and love people. I didn't say tolerate their Sin, because you have no basis of tolerating anything. I didn't say agree with sin. I didn't say bring them into the church to become leaders of the church. I said bring them the gospel and love them. Can you do that? Can you reach out to people who've been hurt and bring the gospel to them? And if not, I might ask a, a question without an answer. Why? What has gotten to you that you cannot love those people who are the unlovable? To appreciate spiritually dead people, know that you and I were people who called upon the name of the Lord. We were people who received the message of reconciliation. We are people who are messengers of reconciliation. How will people hear unless they hear from us? Pastor Rice has given you opportunities. He has engaged you. He's given you the truth. He's told you about the gospel, but you have to take it the next step. This church cannot be based on A.B. Simpson, good singing, loving people, and a good preacher. That's not what this church is about. This church is about a message that God loves us, and then in turn, we're going to love God, love people, and go out there with the gospel and present it to them. Like Betty, you could have the privilege of being a missionary and be invested in Gateway, and I hope you are. Know God. Know His Word. 
share his word. Allow God to reconcile this world to himself. And remember as we close the words that Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. What's your answer?